Okay, welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Proverbs 23. We are in 1 Thessalonians 2. I've got my Bible back. Mm. <laughs> Look at this. Rebound from RR Bibles. Thank you to Brandon who has lovingly rebound it, and I am a happy bunny. Mm -hmm. So let's pray, and let's go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for blessing us with such a wonderful day today, fellowship and friendship and um, time out in your wonderful creation. Thank you above all, Lord, for your word, which is just rich, has treasure within it that we cannot find anywhere else. We pray that you'd open our eyes, that we can see those wonderful things that are in your law. Lord, open our minds and our hearts that we can understand it, that we can respond to it. Lord, please change us. Please forgive us. Please forgive us our stupidity, our foolishness. Please forgive us our hard-heartedness. Please forgive us the fact that we don't treasure it as we should, and we let it go so quickly. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Proverbs 23. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat. Well, that's pretty drastic, isn't it? Why would you do that? Okay. If you are given to appetite. What could be the problem there? Mm -hmm. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Now, I think that's where that little trio of proverbs stops. And it's a very interesting little trio, isn't it? There's, this chapter in Proverbs has a number of little um, collocations of, of proverbs. that uh, It's more than one in a row. I don't think collocations is the right word, but um, a few together. So this is interesting, isn't it? What, what's he talking about? He's talking about going to a, a ruler and there's delicacies and we think, oh, yummy, 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 I can eat, eat, eat. However, these are deceptive food. Why, how could they be deceptive food? Do not desire his delicacies because they're deceptive food. Mm. That's fascinating, isn't it? But it is possible to receive benefits from rulers or pe other people with power and money and influence and to be influenced by them. That's how people with power and money often... Mm gain influence is by dishing out delicacies of one kind or another. So, mm -hmm. so look, I mean, this goes beyond just eating food, doesn't it? But it, if you are in danger of wanting what they are giving, don't be taken in. There's more than, um, there's more than just food on offer. You're not, if you buy into that, what they are selling, you can be t led astray. I think that's the point. So put a knife to your throat. What would that mean? I'm, I'm not going to eat all that I want to eat. I'm not going to desire his delicacies. Mm. All right. Now here's another way you can be taken in. Verse 4. Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. What does desist mean? It means stop to stop. When your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward <laughs> heaven. Okay, that's another couple of proverbs together, isn't it? What's mm -hmm. it about? It's about not giving yourself entirely to the whole business of getting riches. Know when to stop. I think that was the shorter, shorter version of this, isn't it? And why? Because, well, you can't hold on to your riches anyway. They just go. It's foolishness. 
Right, verse 6. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. That's the evil eye, isn't it? Mm. Does it is that how it translates it in the NAS? Selfish man. The yeah. selfish man. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Don't eat the bread of a man who is stingy, nor do, do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you've eaten and waste your pleasant words. Wow. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong and he will plead their cause against you. That's a little section, isn't it? Um, Do not, do not, do not, do not. And it seems to be, I guess, focused on um, well, I don't think there's a, a, a unifying theme to the mm, whole lot. Not being there. greedy. Not being greedy, yeah. Yes, I suppose moving the ancient landmark would be would mm. be connected with that. Mm-hmm. It's because basically you'd be stealing the fields of the fatherless, mm-hmm. would, and they have no... But speaking in the hearing of a fool mm-hmm. doesn't fit with it, does Mm-mm. it? Verse 9, so I was thinking there was a unifying theme but it wasn't so um there we go let's keep going apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge do not withhold discipline from a child if you strike him with a rod he will not die if you strike him with the rod you'll save his soul from shale My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exult when your lips speak what is right. Mm -hmm. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Hear, my son, and be wise, and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. Ouch. (laughs) For the drunkard and the glutton (laughs) will come to poverty. (laughs) We we just barbecued some steak for dinner. (laughs) For the gl- <laughs> what does it say? For the drunk, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Now there's a proverb. <laughs> Buy truth, and do not sell it. By wisdom, instruction, and understanding. That's good, isn't it? It's like you're on the trading floor. <laughs> and, and you've got a chance. Truth is for sale. Are you going to buy it? Are you going to buy it? Are you going to buy it? You gonna, is it it's, up, it's, it's up for sale. It's costly. Truth. Who wants some truth? You want some truth? Mm-hmm. That's the question. You've got someone offering truth for sale. Would you buy it? Yeah, buy truth. And don't sell it. Don't get rid of it. Hold on to it. Buy wisdom, instruction and understanding. I remember when we were thinking about uh, the whole question of whether to go off to study the Bible intensely for a period of time and just this idea that, yes, it's worth sacrificing money in order to have wisdom. It's true, isn't it? I mean, it's in chapter one, it's more precious than silver, more precious than gold. 
Well, if you had gold, if you had silver, but you didn't have wisdom, and yet you could trade, which would you rather have? Mm. <laughs> okay, let me buy some wisdom. I'll do it. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart. And let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit. An adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. Mm. Wow, that's true, isn't it? Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end... It bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. Foolish thing to do, by the way. <laughs> they struck me, you'll say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. That's quite the picture, isn't it? Mm. Someone who drinks too much. It's really scary, isn't it? We, you, uh, you see this a lot. You see people so drunk that they have no idea the damage they're doing to their bodies. <laughs> oh, he hit me, but I wasn't hurt. Hush. <laughs> They beat me, but I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. They go fighting and they don't realise that they're wrecking themselves because mm -hmm. they are wrecked. They're, they're so drunk they can't feel what's going on. It's a disaster, isn't it? Disaster. Mm -hmm. There we are. That's Proverbs 23. Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. What's the book of... Thessalonians all about. Yesterday we learned a little bit about Thessalonica and that wonderful church that had been planted there on Paul's missionary journey. This is the second missionary journey just after the Jerusalem Council which is in AD 49 so then the second missionary journey AD 50 let's say and in AD 51, he's writing this letter to them to encourage them. Um, that they're a great church. Look at verse 1 in chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be trusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labour and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to you, any one of you, 
while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but... God's wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Okay, wonderful picture, isn't it? People who heard the word and received the word and received it as the word of God, as it really is, not as as the word of, word of men, and and how those people were just transformed by it, and they were willing to receive it even in the middle of a great deal of affliction, even in the middle of great troubles and trials. They received the word and they believed it, and they became imitators of Paul and imitators of the churches of. God in Judea, and so on. And then, verse 17, Paul and his companions were torn away from them for a short time. So he's referring back, isn't he, to the time when he planted the church and how they received the word and how they were doing so great. And then they're torn away. And then he's talking about the fact that, in this chapter, he's talking about the fact that they were so... Verse 8, being, so being affectionately desirous of you. So they, they, Paul and his companions longed for the Thessalonians. That's really precious, isn't mm-hmm. it? So he's been there, he's planted the church, there's a lot of trouble, there's a lot of opposition. He has to leave in a hurry, but his heart is left behind. His heart is with them. He's longing for them. And he wants not, he wants, he's like a mother caring for her children, like a father um, with his children. He's exo- he'd exhorted them, he'd charged them, he'd, he'd encouraged them. Like a mother, he was willing to give himself for him. It just, tenderly gentle among them, take, like a mother taking care of her own children. He worked day and night not to be a burden to them, and they knew all of that. And Paul, why is Paul telling them all this again? Why is he saying all this? Well, the best understanding, I think, is that there were people, once again, seems like a pattern, doesn't it? There were people, once again, who were attacking Paul's credibility. They were undermining Paul's um, trustworthiness. And, And bizarrely, having been there and having planted the church and having given himself in love to that church, Paul ends up having to defend himself 
and to say, look, well, this is who I was, and you saw it. This is who, this is, what I was among you was obvious. It was just, this is how we were among you. And, and so Paul's having to kind of lay out his own testimony to them, again, to remind them. Now, that's significant, isn't it? Because it says that, once again, what was typical back in the New Testament church days was that, that while God was at work, while God's servants were at work, the enemy was also at work undermining, accusing, um, trying to get people to believe badly about God's servants. So we shouldn't be surprised if that's what happens to us. Don't be surprised. You could have the godliest pastor ever. You could have the Apostle Paul as the person who planted your church. And then people would come into your church and start undermining the Apostle Paul. So don't be surprised if you've got someone less amazing than the Apostle Paul, <laughs> like me, <laughs> much less amazing than the Apostle Paul, then there's, there's going to be the opportunity and there's going to be the, uh, there's going to be reason for people to come in and to say, oh, I, he's in it for the wrong reasons. He's, he's no good like with the, Corinthians. He's not very impressive with his speech. You know, just his his actually his he's very impressive in his letters, but actually in person he's not very impressive and so on. I mean it's just not surprising, is it, when people do that kind of thing Be, and try to turn God's sheep against their own shepherds. Why? Well, because they're inspired by Satan to do that. And so Paul has to then defend himself. It's, really sad mm. but it really is the way it is mm. okay well, I think it's a good picture of two, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 Jack you want to add some more we've got a couple of minutes of sand here have you got something you'd like to say oh I just think that it's neat that um, when Paul is you know plants the church he's only there about six weeks and it's interesting to consider how much he studied and poured into the Thessalonians um, during six weeks I, you know I think if I had to you know let's say 20 people came to the Lord and I needed to teach them everything they needed to know in six weeks what would I teach them hmm. and um, I find it interesting and you see it pretty much at the end of almost every chapter that he speaks of the coming of the Lord and you keep seeing this theme about mm. Jesus' second coming and it's very clear as you work your way through First and Second Thessalonians that the Apostle Paul thought that prophecy, understanding end times prophecy was super important for brand new believers. Mm. I think that's important today because a lot of churches never teach on it they keep their people completely ignorant of it, but that's not what the Apostle Paul did, and I think we need to mm. follow his example and not treat prophecy as something bad or that can't be understood or there's so many different views or whatever mm -hmm. so that we don't teach people what the Bible clearly says. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that... It's all here for us. We pray that you would um, please open our minds and allow us to understand it, allow us to grasp the heights and the depths of what you have for us. And thank you that Paul wasn't ashamed to um, remind these New Testament Christians of his own behavior so that they could remember that he did love them and he did care for them and he did teach them and Lord, we pray that you would um, help us not to be embarrassed to do the same thing where it's necessary. And Lord, we praise you that he was willing to teach, even in a short space of time, these Christians such um, doctrines as even the things about your return. We pray that we would similarly be able to learn and grasp and teach those 
crucial truths to your children that we might be equipped um, with everything that we need to be able to stand. Mm -hmm. So we pray for your blessing. We thank you for again for this day and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Oh, God bless you and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. I should turn this thing off. Do you want to hold this? <laughs> Bye for now. <laughs>